Well, hello, I'm Julia Hoffman. I'm an assistant professor of media, human rights and conflict at the University for Peace in Costa Rica. And I was asked to give you a little overview today on the international norms that you can draw on if we want to talk about the protection of journalists. So why would we care in the first place? Let's look at journalists in their profession and the special role that they have. And the first thing that you probably will think of is the freedom of expression to be at stake. Obviously it is, freedom of speech um, is an individual right for anybody, including journalists. But it's also important to point out that it has a dual character. When it comes to the protection of journalists, that right doesn't only involve the individual right of journalists as individuals, but also the right to receive information and ideas of the public. So this also makes for a special relevance of the freedom of the press, which has been repeatedly also recognized in international human rights laws, case law. Also journalists have a specific role when it comes to informing the public about, for example, situations of war and conflict. So they could be looked at as a specific category, maybe even, of human rights defenders due to the role that they play. So if we violate their rights, you could argue, we also have a violation of others' rights to access to knowledge, to receive ideas and information. There is, I would argue, an additional urgency talking about the protection of journalists, specifically when it comes in violent, to violent conflicts. There is a rising toll of kidnappings, of unlawful detention, even of murder of journalists covering military conflicts around the world. There have been 887 journalists killed worldwide since 1992, and 17% of them covering, cross, covering conflicts have been killed in crossfire or conflict situations. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, 154 journalists were killed in crossfire and or combat from 92 to 2011. And to make things even worse, maybe 2012 has to been the worst year, the deadliest on record for media. According to the International Press Institute, at least 119 journalists were killed only last year. That seems to be the highest number since they tracked the attacks against media professionals in 1997. This is not only a human tragedy, it also has effects that we would have to consider in a larger social perspective. It has a chilling effect. If you murder a journalist, you're also sending a signal. It, has a pro it is a provocative warning to others not to pursue that specific uh, line of investigation. That also comes, uh, becomes relevant when we talk about, for example, organized crime. Journalists covering not only armed conflicts, as we would think of maybe in terms of classical ideas of war, but also when it comes to, for example, drug cartels. It leads to self-censorship. It leads to a decrease in our access to information. There's also a rampant problem of impunity. So the lack of prosecutions, the lack of effective investigations when it comes to the perpetrators of crimes of violence against journalists. So for example, the, in 2006, you may remember Anna Politovskaya's murder has still failed to make any convictions. The trial of four of the alleged killers ended in 2009 um, with three of them being acquitted. And while the Investigative Committee of Russia has filed new charges against the number of uh, suspects in 2011, the trial is still going on five years later. So there is also a climate, you could, ask, you could argue, of impunity that is going to be detrimental for the freedom of the press. So let's look at the international norms that can help us understand what kind of protections that we do find in these um, rules. So let's have a look at the international human rights law norms we can find. Uh, there's a plethora of relevant uh, treaties that contain similar provisions which are relevant for the protection of journalists. Some of them you can find here. The most pertinent being the right to life, obviously, personal liberty and integrity, the freedom from torture, the freedom of expression, and the right to an effective remedy. These are not only contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also in the ICCPR and regional instruments such as that of Europe and the Inter-American system. You can also look at the relatively recent general comment on Article 19, which was published in 2011, which further clarifies the scope of states' obligations under Article 19 of the ICCPR and underlines that states 
not only have negative obligations, but also positive obligations when it comes to this right. It says that states must also ensure that persons are protected from any acts or priva of private persons or entities that would impair the enjoyment of freedoms of opinion and expression. It also states all allegations of attacks on or other forms of intimidation or harassment of journalists, human rights defenders and others should be vigorous vigorously investigated. The perpetrators prosecuted and the victims, or in the case of killings, their representatives, be in receipt of appro appropriate forms of redress. So while there is no specific international legal instrument that is dealing specifically and only with the protection of the safety of journalists, you could say there is a number of starting points in international human rights law that can help you make your arguments here. Also worthwhile to point out that the end of last year, um, the UN Human Rights Council has passed a consensus resolution sponsored by the Republic of Austria that has called on states to promote a safe and enabling environment for journalists to perform their work independently and to fight impunity. So in essence, you could say states have negative obligations to refrain, obviously, from killing, ill treatment, unlawful arrest or interference that are likely to threaten the safety and physical integrity of journalists but they also have positive obligations, taking all effective measures to protect journalists against actions of private parties, as well as the use of lethal force of state uh, security forces, as well as to end the problem of impunity, to bring perpetrators of violence to justice to effectively investigate and punish their crimes. So you could say states are internationally uh, responsible not only for their actions, but importantly also for their inactions when it comes to this. This is one example you could have a closer look, in, look at if you want to, which is from the Inter-American System Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Dr. Catalina Botero, who has distilled a number of recommendations and proposals for standard setting, detailing a little bit what the negative and positive obligations of states would entail. Let's look at what happens uh, as soon as there is violent armed, there is armed conflict. There is a specific um, international legal regime that kicks in when and as soon as a situation can be classified as an armed conflict for the purposes of international humanitarian law, obviously relevant for journalists working in war zones. And also, for example, here it has been made very clear that the specific role of journalists in these armed conflicts needs to be considered. For example, the ICTY has recognized the important function of journalists working in war zones to be of serving a public interest. They're playing a vital role for us as international public and the international community as such to be alerted to all the different human rights violations and the horrors and reality of warfare. This is also mirrored in the ICTY granting the uh, journalists testimonial testimonial privileges, for example. So let's look at this, international armed conflict. Well, first of all, it would be important to point out that human rights norms as such do not just simply cease to exist or apply as soon as humanitarian law kicks in. There are, for example, the right to life and the right to freedom from torture that are non-derogable under the ICCPR, the European Convention on Human Rights, as well as the Inter-American Charter. As a general rule, you can go by that is journalists engaged in dangerous professional missions in areas of armed conflicts are considered to be civilians, which means that they shall not be the object of attack unless and for such time as they are directly participating in hostilities. This is the rule of customary international humanitarian law that is given expression in the article that you will see on the slides measures of protection for journalists in Article 79 of the Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Convention of 1949. The article confirms that journalists are civilians defined under Article 50, 50 and consequently must enjoy the same levels of protection that are provided for in the Convention and the, article and the Additional Protocol. This includes not being an object of an attack and a general measure of protection against the dangers arising from military situations. 
It does not, importantly, extend to communications and PR staff that is employed by the military. This also means that protection of journalists under these rules will be lost uh, as soon as a journalist would take action that would adversely affect his or her status as a civilian. There's also a specific provision in international humanitarian law that um, corresponds to war correspondence. War correspondents are defined as journalists who accompany the armed forces of a state without actually being members thereof. They're also great granted civilian status by Article 50 of the Additional Protocol 1, as well as being afforded civilian protection, therefore. But when specifically authorized to accompany armed forces, uh, they also have uh, additional rights. They're also entitled, namely, to prisoner of war status. Uh, if captured and are granted the same protection as members of the army whilst in the end of the enemy party. Article 4A4 states that the armed forces that war correspondents are accompanying uh, should issue them with an identity card attesting to their status. So this is a very official category of, of journalists. Interestingly, if you look at the years when these uh, instruments were drafted, this was preceding a system that we find increasingly now in modern warfare calling embedded journalism, which has led to some controversy also in the, in the literature on whether or not um, embedded journalists who travel with military unit, units should be treated the same as war correspondents. Let's look at what happens not only to the journalists as a physical person, but what kind of protection media equipment and installations enjoy under international humanitarian law. Well, also here you could say media equipment installation should be considered as civilian objects, therefore shall not be the object of an attack, unless, again, they make an effective contribution to military action by their nature, location, purpose or use such as by the transmission of military intelligence or military orders. And their total or par partial destruction, capture or neutralization in the circumstances ruling at the time offers a definite military advantage. You can already see how open to contextual interpretation this provision is likely going to be in the context of a real battle going on. Most legal scholars would uh, probably agree that the general protection afforded to civilian objects under Article 52 of the First Protocol corresponds to a customary, customary role, rule in international humanitarian law. But we also live in a highly technologi technological age, which means that we often make what is called dual use, so civilian and military use of certain objects. And that has consequences when it comes to the applic applicable rules and protection levels of these objects. So for example, civilian objects such as roads or railway networks or schools that are temporarily used for military purposes or used for both military and civil service, uh, purposes become legitimate targets. So for example, if you look at what happened in 2003, the information ministry in Baghdad was bombed twice by coalition forces, even though it was known that that, also was how that building was also housing offices of international media, for example. In the same year in April, an American tank shelled the Hotel Palestine, though it was known that it was a gathering spot for the foreign press in the city at that time. And in fact, the spokesman of the US Defense Department then justified the attack that it had, the hotel had been a military objective during the 48 hours that it had also been a meeting point for Iraqi officials. During NATO's air bombing attack in Yugoslavia, RTS, a, a, radio, a television station, was also bombed on the grounds that the facilities were being used not only for civilian purposes, but would be arguably part of the Serbian army's command, control, and communications network. That incident was lat later reviewed by the ICT's committee of review, which considered that if the RTS facilities were indeed also used as an army forces transmitter, it had become a military objective. Another interesting question in this regard would be 
the use of the media to disseminate propaganda, hate speech. We have another interesting case of the ICTR this time, the prosecutor versus Nahimana, another judgment of 2003, which concluded that hate propaganda broadcasts published in written media or support or, or a broadcast supporting one party in the conflict might be qualified as acts of violence and thus as active participation in the conflict. So this has tremendous implication for the protection of journalists as well under international humanitarian law. So despite an increasing prevalence interestingly of non-international armed conflicts. It's notable that international humanitarian law does not afford any special protection to war correspondents or any other independent journalists to exercise their professional activities in such conflicts. State practice, and if you look at military manuals as well that are applied to non-international armed conflicts, however, lead you or lead me to suggest that they would be granted the same protection as civilians still even in these contexts. There's also a fundamental customary rule of international humanitarian law that civilians may not be attacked unless they actively participate in hostilities. So also here, Article 79 of the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions would apply to non-international armed conflicts. So to sum that up, journalists are protected as civilians, but afforded no special protection that would result from their profession of being professional journalists. Let's look at a few trends and challenges that may need to be crossing your mind when you're going to be preparing your memorials here. First of all, it is very important to define who we're talking about if we want to talk about the protection of journalists. In other words, who is a journalist at all? And if you look at the recent changes in technology you can also very easily see there's been quite dramatic changes and an extension of the definition of what a journalist actually is. Or, well, as I've put it, who's not, really. Anyone with access to the internet can today be a vital informer of the public. You can see that, for example, what happened in Syria. That was hugely a blackout of traditional media. It was very hard for professional journalists to go into the war zones and what we relied upon and what also large television broadcasters and traditional media such as Al Jazeera would li rely upon was citizen journalism in the widest sense. People that went out with their mobile phones and sent in uh, videos that were broadcast subsequently across the world. That has led to a number of reflections also within the human rights and humanitarian law community. And one of the examples I would like to put to you, for example, is in the 2010 annual report of the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Expression, Frank de la Rue. He defined journalists as, and I quote, individuals who are dedicated to investigating, analyzing and disseminating information in a regular and specialized manner through any type of written media, broadcast media or electronic media. With the advent of new forms of communication, journalism has extended into new areas, including citizen journalism. On the slide, I'm showing you the definition proposed recently by the Human Rights Committee, again in its general comment number 34 on Article 19, that is defining journalism as a function shared by a wide range of actors, including professional full-time reporters and analysts, as well as bloggers and others who engage in forms of self-publication in print, on the internet or elsewhere. Now, while these are authoritative guidelines, it's by no means to say that there is undisputed consensus about this. There's still a lot of fragmentation and contestation at the regional as well as national level what this definition of a journalist could entail. That also has uh, obviously re uh, res um, consequences for their protection status within national jurisdictions, for example. The activities of normal people, bloggers, citizen journalists, also expose journalists or these people to specific types of risks nowadays. Citizen journalists are usually unpaid. They're also usually untrained and, well, Un, un, uh, they don't enjoy the same safeguards from their uh, professional organizations that professional journalists would do. And they do also not automatically possess any of the extra rights uh, 
that journalists are granted by states. Even though, funny enough, in many places of the world, those are the only sources of information that we have left. They're only ones sometimes to be still able and willing to actually report on certain issues as well as from certain places. Again, it's interesting to note that journalists reporting on organized crime and corruption, for example, uh, are affected in all media, from radio, print, to television, and online. And specifically, it seems, citizen journalists, bloggers, online journalists, are increasingly being targeted by organized crime syndicates, narco-traffic, uh, for opinions expressed in the internet rather than in print media and traditional outlets. So, for example, last year in September, the editor of the Nuevo Laredo newspaper in Mexico, her name was Maria Elizabeth Macias, was found decapitated next to a note that connected her murder quite clearly to comments she had made on social, social networks. Another number of challenges for you to digest while you're thinking along with me here. First of all, it could be noted that there's rather extensive uh, legal framework that would provide for a lot of starting points for a very robust protection of journalists in situations of, uh, uh, of conflict. But, as with almost all humanitarian law and human rights norms, there is a lack of implementation and enforcement of these existing rights. Media professionals are not only being killed, they're also being increasingly the object of another number of forms of violence, including kidnappings, including torture, harassment, unlawful imprisonment. And it seems to corro corroborate a trend of increasingly willful attacks despite the protected status under international humanitarian law, not only from state actors, but also non-state actors. There's also an obvious failure to protect journalists, not only in the case of an ongoing armed conflict, but also when it comes to prevention. Because a lot of journalists actually are warned and threatened before anything happens. And it seems that there is a lack of willingness by states to provide preventive protection of journalists when they are being threatened. The importance of impunity is probably something I would like to well, highlight again for the, with the, taking the risk of rep repetition because it's such an amazing rampant problem. If you look at the numbers, the Committee to Protect Journalists, for example, um, issues his, uh, its impunity index and concludes that more than 94% that, that of attacks on journalists around the world are not investigated at all. There's also, well, if you look at, if you look at the list of countries which are topping the list, it's clear that war-torn societies are the most rampant problem here. Iraq and Somalia rank first and second in the number of journalist killings that were not investigated and prosecuted. There's also changes in the relationship between the military and the press as systems, as professions, you could argue. War reporting, of course, has always been a risky enterprise. That's no doubt about it. And being proximate to the battlefield, being close to armed forces, you are just simply more likely to become victim of a stray bullet or be caught up in friendly fire, as it is so nicely and euphemistically termed. However, the critical role that journalism is playing in the, heart, the, the battle for hearts and minds, the importance of public opinion, the importance of media representation of what's going on in battlefields, means that civilian media facilities have also been increasingly targeted as part of the war effort. Media management, I would argue, is becoming increasingly seen as an integral part of military strategy. You can also see that in newer regimes aimed at engaging the press more actively, but also controlling them more effectively. For example, through um, the introductions of the embedded system, which may also have led to a distinctive perception of the role of the press in battlefields. It may no longer be that a jacket that says press or TV on your bulletproof vest uh, is actually going to induce parties to armed conflict to respect your neutrality. Because if the perception of the press 
as becoming integral part to one of the army of the of the, of the parties to conflict uh, is is um, changing, that may also erode the neutrality, the perception of neutrality of the press, making journalists even more likely to become targets, specifically also by non-state actors, armed groups, insurgent groups, guerrilla groups. Which brings me to another point. Non-state armed groups and organized crime. We've witnessed a change in the nature of warfare since the Geneva Conventions have been adopted. We see a shift away from international armed conflict between regular armies towards an increase in internal armed conflicts involving non-state actors, such as insurgency groups. According to Reporters Without Borders, 141 journalists and media workers were killed between 2000 and 2010 by organized criminals. Journalists reporting on organized crime also often lack protection from state police forces. There is a risk in regions where there is little state control and also the legitimate monopoly of states on violence has collapsed. There's an increasing problem if you have widespread corruption and a dysfunctional judiciary and even worse if you are in a state where organized crime and state actors have become convoluted. If there is uh, increasing corruptions and you are reporting on the links between politics and organized crime, the numbers show that that is the most risky business you can be engaged in as a journalist. Organized crime outlets are also not only concerned with journalists in the sense of what they're publishing, but simply what they, are, what they know. So just being a journalist, quite apart from what you publish, can already bring you in a very, very um, tricky situation and at risk. If we look at the new technologies, we mostly tend to see new opportunities, which they undoubtedly have created, but it's also important to point out there's also creation of new risks. There's also new vulnerabilities, especially when it comes to the work of journalists. Like us, journalists rely increasingly on social media. They use Twitter, they rely on their cell phones, uh, they use Facebook, but they are not very well versed apparently in security technology. Many of them don't understand or use, for example, VPN, encryption technologies. They don't really know how to safely remove data from their laptop, laptops, making them vulnerable also to technological surveillance and interception, making also their sources more vulnerable like that. There is a 2012 survey of 102 journalists and, and bloggers that was conducted by the International Federation of Journalists, for example, in 20 Mexican states, which shows that nearly 70% have been threatened or have suffered attacks because of their work. Additionally, 96% of those interviewed said that they knew somebody, a colleague who had been attacked. And when asked what they looked at as the most severe risks they're running in the digital age, they say it was about cyber espionage and email account cracking. So while on the first hand, on, the, on one hand, social media has increased and diversified the range of traditional media importing from Al Jazeera to CNN to um, all the big ones, there's also this increasing cyber activism has also a flip side. It has been answered by increasing cyber surveillance. And a number of states have very aggressively answered to this. Also being, um, well, helped, I'm afraid to say, by a number of uh, private entities, technology corporations, most famously maybe, as you may know, the censorship of political dissent, which is enabled by electronic surveillance technology that was exported to Iran by Nokia Siemens. Or if you want to remember the complicity of Yahoo when it came to identifying a journalist in China um, called Xi Tao. So increasingly also states are reacting to the emergence of citizen journalism, also using this new technology to, well, shoot back if you want. So you see, for example, things like in, in Egypt 2002, the Interior Ministry created a directorate for computer and internet crimes, which has been reportedly used to persecute bloggers. Similar practices you can find you can find in 
Burma, there's cyber attacks being launched by countries for exile media to get them down. There is other ways, such in Syria, where there is um, emergency laws being passed that are authorizing uh, states to also prosecute citizen journalists in military courts for rather ambiguous offenses, such as in the Syrian case, when it comes to crimes that constitute an overall hazard. There's also specific laws being drafted against citizen journalists. For example, Iran uh, amended its press law in 2000 to include all forms of electronic media in the prohibition of anything that would promote subjects that might damage the foundation of the Islamic Republic. In February 2009, legislation was approved by the Parliamentary Commission making online expression perceived to be against the will of God punishable by a death sentence. Looking at all these trends and challenges, you may wonder, isn't there a need for special protection of journalists, at least under international humanitarian law, when it comes to their profession in armed conflicts? Well, it's not a new idea. It was actually considered during the drafting um, of the additional protocols to the Geneva Convention, but rejected because journalists could, in fact, run an increased risk to it. The so-called press emblem campaign was devised in 2006 in a report to the Human Rights Council and again was um, discussed as, well, proposed as Article 7 of a draft proposal for an international convention to strengthen the protection of journalists in zones of armed conflict and civil unrest. It's still being criticized as potentially being ineffective because just putting a new emblem out, creating a new special group that would have special protective status without actually changing the adjacent rules may in fact not make the rules more effective. So you could question whether or not it's about an extra symbol or just about impl implementing existing rules more uh, robustly. It's also a question if, in light of my earlier comment, if you did point out and signify, symbolize journalists more explicitly, that may in fact, due to the changes in military press relations, lead to an increased risk of journalists rather than a lower risk. Well, to end my short introduction for your preparations, I have put together a number of additional little tips. How about that? So in addition to preventing tax attacks on journalists, there's a number of UN uh, Security Council as well as General Assembly resolutions that have emphasized a need for states to actively engage in ensuring respect and protection of journalist safety. So for example, the UN Security Council Resolution 1738 in 2006 uh, condemned attacks of jour on journalists in armed uh, in conflict situations and also emphasized again the responsibility of states to comply with the relevant obligation under international law to end impunity. There is, in short, a plethora of sources that you can refer to, and to make it even more comprehensive, there's a number of declarations also issued by actors such as UNESCO that you may want to refer to to guide the normative framework of your argumentations for your moot court memorial, memorials. And lastly, I'll leave you with a number of starting points for your literature research. And the well, last thing that rests me to say is good luck. <laughs>